Henrik, welcome back to Access to Perspectives Conversations, our podcast show primarily about what? Well, equally about open science topics and also mental well-being in academia, as well as career opportunities and research management and other topics that are of interest to researchers. Welcome back. It's great having you again. It's really great to be back with you. I really enjoyed our previous conversation and I look forward today to go a bit more into depth about personal experience about mental health, which is well, we didn't really have time for last time, right? Yeah, and yeah, and there's, there should be more than enough time. Um, we will have time for this today. And last time, for those who didn't have the chance to listen to the previous episode with you just yet, but you can, of course, go back and um, listen to it after this one. Um, we talked about your role at Jena University as a mental health first aider and what got you into it, why you're interested and so passionate about the topic, um, some of the questions you receive and uh, the support you can give to people who find themselves in difficult situations, oftentimes not really being aware that they have a mental health condition of some sort. And it's oftentimes, as I've experienced, also stress born. Um, but of course, it's multifactorial, multi multi is it quite a disease? Yeah, multivector, multivectorial, yes, that's it. Um, yeah, so, um, and today you and I committed to talk about our personal experience. Yes. Um, so would you mind giving it a head start? I've already gave some teasers in previous episodes with yourself and also with other um, guests on the show. Um, but yeah. Please tell us about your journey and did just just to tie that in with you know last time we talked about the mental health first aid work I do at the university and a lot of stigma reduction work that I do mm -hmm. and I found that it's incredibly important that people speak up with their own testimonials um, that is what something I found that really resonates with people that um, often people say oh that is so brave to talk about it I don't consider it like that anymore because it's for me, it's become really, really easy to talk about um, because I, I see the positive effect it generates in others. It, it, it invites others to reflect on themselves and say, hey, well, you know, if this guy acknowledged that he had a problem, maybe I should be looking at myself as well. Mm. Um, so, and so I, I think we cannot really have enough role models uh, and, and I don't wish to qualify myself as a role model there, perhaps, but um, but examples of people, particularly in academia, who speak out about it and, and who are also seen to have successful careers, right? Well, the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the examples I always like to give is that Sir Isaac Newton probably had a mental health condition. He was probably bipolar, it, it is now thought. And also Charles Darwin had a mm -hmm. mental health condition. Um, so having a mental health condition or, or illness does not preclude you from being successful in science or in any profession. And, um, I think we need more examples of that yeah. in order for people to be able to overcome their own barriers. And uh, well, one doctor once told me when I was concerned about his diagnosis, diagnosis, like he just bluntly said, you know what, the brain is just another organ yeah. and it can dysfunction at times if it's triggered or like malnourished with certain nutrients or whatever, you know, triggered by too much stress, then it's an organ which has sometimes issues and some of these issues can be fixed. And oftentimes it's just giving yourself enough of a break and, and time to heal and exactly. restructure your life in a way that's more, yeah, more, you know, by looking after yourself, by having enough room to recover from the daytime stress. But when he said that, I was like, no, like the brain is like my personality. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I felt I wasn't really myself. And because you mentioned the stigma, like there's not much talk about mental health conditions in society. It's increasing. Like in Germany, there is now a few, like more or less famous people who spoke up about it. Um, but um, otherwise, 
yeah it's a constant stigma and not, like it's some people brag about having a broken arm and then you know get signatures on the cast but how would you do that with uh, your mental health condition? well i think i think going out there and saying hey as as is today's title i believe is um hey yes i've had a mental health condition get over it i have um and that perhaps is the virtual uh, uh, cast that that you can get signatures on in in the sense of people do come back to you and say this has really helped me thank you so much so you know without further beating around the bush i had a an, an anxiety disorder um and in a fairly typical fashion i left it way too long until i was ready to accept therapy uh, and this is something also i've noticed and something that I had forgotten about myself, um, how a lot of people are kind of afraid of psychotherapy. They don't know what it is. They think they will get branded as crazy. They think a therapist is going to take their personality apart and say, there is something wrong with you. We have this imagery of being put in a padded cell with uh, you know, a jacket that closes around the back and kind of, I in the worst case, you, you might be put into some asylum to to rot away for eternity and 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 then people have problems or fears about um, medical treatment as well because it is so closely linked with our personalities for me talking about no uh, mental health has become so normalized that i've almost forgotten my own fears about this mm -hmm. when it happened to me and this is um what probably leads to what is a quite eye-watering statistic that in in on average sorry people need seven to eight years from the onset of their mental health condition until they are ready to accept or seek out help um, and this is classically what happened to me so when i had an anxiety disorder that re reflecting back on it happened when i um, started going to university so i was fine in high school not a problem and then a major life change happened and psychologists will tell you that this is uh, can be one of the triggers of uh, of a mental health condition. So my life changed completely. I was independent and able to do whatever I wanted. And perhaps I didn't always make the right choices. Um, and and then looking back, I'm pretty sure that's when it happened. I wasn't ready to accept that something was wrong until I was at the end of my PhD. So roughly eight years later. And when I was writing my thesis, and that's that's really when I fell into a hole where, where things fell apart and I had to accept, you know, something's got to give. This is not right. And I went to see my house doctor. Um, something I want to say about anxiety disorder. And of course, my condition got gradually worse. It, it didn't quite start out that way, perhaps. And that's maybe also why you don't recognize it necessarily early on. But I think there's a, a lot of misconception about anxiety disorder, as there are misconceptions about many mental health conditions. For instance, the misconception that being depressed is just being like this. A lot of depressed people, like Robin Williams, for instance, are, are very smiley on the outside, but mm. very, very depressed indeed on the inside. And, and an, uh, I think a misconception about anxiety disorder is um, that... People think, oh, there's you, you might be anxious, you might be a bit nervous about certain things and and um, wind yourself up perhaps a bit too much. But it goes far, uh, far further than that. It, it, it escalates to absolutely debilitating fear, where in my worst episodes, I simply was unable to set foot outside my bedroom door. You know, I just couldn't get out of my bed or... or god forbid out into the street to go to the supermarket to buy food and a supermarket was not even five minutes walk from my place and i was just irrationally but completely afraid of being among people um and to such an extent that i would avoid it and until i really had to say well if i don't go now i'm going to starve so what you know what's what's the worst of the two evils here so really, really incapacitating fear where you 
build that fear up inside yourself so badly that you start to get physical reactions. Mm -hmm. And so I would get stomach cramps and that would lead to the fear to throw up. And of course, that was then one of my fears. If I were to go in public, if I were, what if I throw up on a bus or in a tram or in the supermarket? That's so embarrassing. So I would avoid those um, situations. And if I had to go somewhere, I would avoid eating. I would avoid having something in my stomach because my stomach would be so painful when I went into these situations um, that I would, that the solution to that was don't eat. You don't eat, you can't throw up, you know, and you, your stomach cramps are less. So I was really thin as a student. Um, and yeah, I had all these excuses for when I would get invited to this or that by friends. I'd always, you know, always often drop out at the last minute, not go to stuff that all my other friends did go to make up some excuse. I'm sure that lots of my friends had an inkling something wasn't right, but you tell yourself that they don't, you know, you think that that everybody buys your excuses. I'm sure my family had an inkling something wasn't right. But it's um, it's a difficult one to address, mm. uh, and uh, yeah, so it's, that's a point I did want to make about anxiety disorder. It's not just being nervous; it mm. is absolutely being scared to death of everyday things, stepping mm. on a bus. And is it possible to pinpoint to what you are scared of, or is it sometimes just fear? Um, it's, I, I, I think the best way to describe it is I would, situations where I felt I was not in control over my choices, whether I wanted to be somewhere or not, mm -hmm. that would freak me out. I guess it's, there is an element of claustrophobia there, of being locked up. So like the example of the bus I gave, the minute those doors of the bus close, you can't go anywhere. You can't say... I'm out of here now uh, until the next stop. And, and you know, the two minutes to the next stop would seem like an eternity to me. And I would be, and then the doors open, I'd be, am I going to get out or can I make it to the next one? That's how every germ, tra train journey was for me. Um, university lectures, being in a huge room with, with lots of students. And then if I felt that I needed to room, needed to leave the room, That would have been obvious to everybody that would draw attention to you. So if I went, I would stay at the back of the room near the door if I went at all. Mm. So not being in control of situations of whether I chose to be there or not is, I think, the, the most easy, straightforward way I could describe it. But the, it was, you know, a bit more complicated than that. But yeah. Yeah, I, I can relate to that, not with anxiety. I have a friend who suffers from anxiety episodes. She also found a way to manage it, but that's also what she described. So she, like, she was just scared and then could also name a few things she was scared of. But, you know, for somebody who doesn't, is not in such a state of mind, like in this case myself, it was hard to empathize i mean i felt sorry for on her behalf but like not to com be confused with pity or anything like that but yeah it was difficult to to understand really what that's like and and like in my case it was depression and i'm sure there's also in like mixed um anxiety slash depression conditions um and Like in, in my case, it was more like I I lost belief in myself, like self-worth was almost gone or declining. And, and so I was like, what's the use of me being on this planet after all? I recognize that too. And I think, you know, a lot of these things I was, I was uh, sorry, diagnosed eventually when, mm -hmm. you know, when I did come to my breakdown, probably describe that later as having an anxiety disorder. But I'm absolutely convinced that I also had episodes of depression yeah, that were linked to that. It goes together. Or, exactly. Uh, so you think, I'm so useless, I'm so worthless, I can't even go to the supermarket. 
what is what is the matter with me what is the point of me um you know would anybody even care if i wasn't here tomorrow and i wouldn't say that i was ever actively suicidal um but i certainly thought at occasions what's the point of this what's the point of life if it is like this yeah. so i do think that it's sometimes difficult to draw the line and say okay you've got an anxiety disorder i think it often comes hand in hand with other things i just and uh, i think we sh we should definitely talk about depression as well mm -hmm. i just in in describing anxiety disorder i just remembered there's a song by lou reed and it's called waves of fear Mm -hmm. It's on the Man with the Blue Mask, or, or, or no, the Blue Mask album of Lou Reed. Um, maybe you can put a link underneath. Oh, yeah, we'll embed well. it in the show notes and the blog post. Sure. That is a song that I think really, for me, resonates with these feelings of absolute fear of anything. I think he says, you know, in the song, he says, what, what's that noise? What's Who's that outside? What's that thing on the floor? I, you know, I, 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 I hate my own breath. I, I can't stand myself. I mean, it, it just in in a matter of three minutes or so, really captures. I think me at at some of my worst moments, um, and as art can often do, right? Can can really make these things come to life. Uh, I would um, for for anybody interested to to get a, a an idea of of what an panic attack or severe anxiety might feel like i can really recommend that song by Reed, mm. waves of fear from the blue mask album yeah thanks for mentioning that i found it and i will add it to the reference list to this episode um yeah okay so depression oh, so continue I, it, uh, tell us a bit more about your depression then I, I think also it started in I think maybe some of us have a, what like a, I think some of us especially researchers artists I think people who seek into certain professions um, have that's this is my personal observation um, are predestined to sooner or later run into mental health episodes or issues just I, don't, I wouldn't say pre-design is probably a bit strong but per, per, perhaps there is a bit more yeah. I mean I, I think if if your career is really kind of tied up with a calling in life and with your identity and perhaps oh, yeah, it yeah. and it doesn't always pan out and and a scientific as well as an artistic career are not easy paths and so when that difficult career paths is very much aligned with how you identify as an artist or as a scientist. I think that could lead to in increased incidence of self-doubt and along with that, anxieties, depressions, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't know why I started with it. I, I think I didn't want to isolate myself <laughs> and describing what I went through and rather embed myself into a whole group of people, all of which, and I think there's also- but It is true. I mean, it is extremely common among yeah. academics. Yeah, so academics- We, we know that, right? Yeah. From, um, the, from the scientific studies triggered by the work of Katja Levesque. Yeah, and then also finding ourselves in a very demanding working environment and stressful environment competition i think yeah. competition is healthy to a very low extent <laughs> and then it becomes poisonous um when we are forced to work against each other where we're meant and wired to actually collaborate which is also what researchers in intuitively want to do and generally want to do but then the system is um, demanding competition of us and forcing us into, yeah, um, public yeah. I mean, like out of our don't research, get started on that because that's a whole other kind of world. That's a whole other. Because there are of, plenty of, course, of science talking material. Should be, science should be this objective thing where, through reason, 
we we uncover the mysteries of the universe when in reality it's like a personality cult who gets gets the Nobel Prize. So there's a lot of ego right. tied into it and competition. So and and that's not very objective. And uh, you know there are, there are ample examples starting with Watson and Crick of of, of questionable assignment of the uh, of the Nobel prizes as well. So objectivity and science are not necessarily um, directly related. <laughs> <laughs> True. But, okay. Uh, let's so not go I'm there. Trying to set the stage for my describing myself. I'm just diverting into other topics, but here it comes. So I th I think when I look back and um kind of when I put myself back into my own childhood, I I think I was always I wouldn't call it anxious, but cautious of other people, and sometimes as a child also I would have kind of moments of where I was scared to meet new people. I would, maybe that's also normal for some children. Or there's those who are outgoing and those who are more reserved. As a teenager, I was all of a sudden more outgoing and curious and happy to meet other people. Um, yeah, and then during, what is it, high school, um, like I got totally um obsessed with the wars that were going on and also famine like ecological disasters to the extent where i said i can't go to school anymore this is way more serious <laughs> and, and like it really got under my skin what happened in the world and and i think what i also want to add i think people who have a lot of empathy and curiosity in other people and and things in the world to study I think that also comes with a sensitivity which can then easily lead to overwhelm but you know these are just my personal mm -hmm. um, out of my own experience observation I think those are and all I, very valid things yeah and then the worst episode was where I thought okay there's no way out of here was during my PhD and then also like shortly after the like the peak uh, or midterm where I realized like many of us PhD students like oh my god more than half of the time is already gone and how little results do I have and how did I waste my time with that's that's what I then thought before I was like oh it's good to have a he um, healthy work-life balance kind of activities besides research so I went scuba diving I did horse horse riding and natural horsemanship exercises <laughs> just to keep myself out of the lab at times and not to over obsess with research 24 seven. And because that also interested me, but then all of a sudden I got a feeling of guilt that I spent too much time outside, even though I would still work the 50 hours that are normal. And some of us, some, some academics or many work way more, more than that. But then I felt, okay, I didn't take holidays. I did spend some time with horses and and scuba diving and yeah and now what i don't have enough results and and then what did i do to my pi to my supervisor because he clearly also depends on me being efficient so then i developed this feeling of guilt not only um failure for myself but also failing other people and i was like what is <laughs> like what did i do <laughs> and that's when i ran into a uh, depressive episode of like yeah totally lost and oh my god like i'm totally useless like you described previously and the worst feeling also like i wouldn't i don't think i was really suicidal but you know the feelings of what if mm -hmm. um i took my life and i was going through scenarios and whatever scenario i could think of was like no that's just causing a mess and those poor people who are gonna find me like no i can't do that to them so i think people who are really suicidal don't think of other people who would then have to clean up that mess <laughs> that you leave behind and like the like it totally went around when i thought of my parents i was like ah oh, my friends they will get over it if they have other friends but to my parents my dad was still alive I was like, no, I can't do it to them. And also not to myself, really thinking about it, but like life is too precious. So 
but but it, the depression was so severe that I thought I would never get out of it. And then I found a place of acceptance. Okay, so then this is the state I'm in for the rest of my life, and I just keep pushing. And I also from the scuba people, I had friends who would eventually realize like, oh, Joe's become really quiet. She's not joined the training sessions anymore. What's going on? So they were calling me and stepping up at my door and like forcing me, taking me on a holiday like, um, and dragging me out of it. And that also helped me to re-socialize after I isolated this, I would still go to work, but really just sneak around. I wasn't capable of doing anything meaningful for my research. And um, I was just trying to show presence as much as possible and working really hard or working on inside, like, you know, what nobody could see, but it was so hard to, um, to try and be productive where there was no energy really to be productive. But then- I, that, that lack of energy, I also recognize actually. Yeah, and yeah. I, the feeling is so bad because you know, well, I have it in me, but where is it? Like, yeah. Yeah, what, I used to be capable of doing so many things and now nothing, like really? Can I not even do like this one thing, this one experiment? <laughs> I, I found it quite interesting what you mentioned about when you thought about you had perhaps feelings of being feeling inadequate in doing your PhD work. And this is a discussion that has become quite prominent also with the, um, what's it called again, the uh, um, imposter syndrome. Uh, the funny thing with me is that I never really had that. For me, in, in a sense, my PhD which I was doing while I had my anxiety disorder and while my anxiety disorder was probably at, at its peak. My PhD was, I, I guess, a bit of a saving grace um, because I was in a natural science. I was working in a laboratory. A laboratory is an environment where I am in control. I design the experiment. I decide when the time points are taken. And, you know, and I was really engaged with that. I was doing something I loved. That was fine. I had a mission there. So that was always something I was very committed to. What was difficult for me were group meetings. If we would have Monday morning group meetings or so, 10 people in a room, and mm -hmm. you'd have to sit there wait, uh, watching somebody present, I, I don't have to go back into the details. That was what was really hard for me. But um, the the work of doing the PhD, the actual research was, was something that gave me a purpose. Mm -hmm. And perhaps eventually was also what helped me accept that I needed therapy because the moment I can qu quite accurately pinpoint when I had my turnaround moment. And it was when I handed in my PhD thesis, I had done months and months of working, writing, writing, finally my supervisor. And I must say I had a super, super fantastic supportive supervisor. Um, said it was okay so you handed it in and that's when i could do whatever i wanted i was free to do you know it, it should have been a moment of celebration and in fact i had planned to go on a backpacking trip with my brother to china and we had the visa arranged and such everything a lot of organization went into that because china this was in the um late 90s was also far more closed country than mm -hmm. it has since become um and I realized I couldn't, I couldn't face that trip. I, all of these fears of, and you know, imagine how many buses and airplanes and whatnot you have to get on to get to China. I thought, no way, I can't do this. Mm. I, I freaked out at, at the thought of it. And so I had to say my, to my brother, I'm, I'm at rock bottom here and I can't do this. And that's when I went to see my house doctor and the house doctor said sounds like an anxiety disorder sounds to me like you might benefit from psychotherapy here's the uh, number of a clinic nearby but mind you it might take a month or two or three uh, because of waiting lists and i remember i was just at the phone so nervous making a phone call to make a phone call to make an appointment with the mm -hmm. psychotherapist I, I must have sat in front of that phone for hours before I was able to dial the number. But that's a moment of exposure, right? You're exposing yourself of needing help. 
Yeah, and 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 I guess you are then it becomes real that you might be branded as crazy, right? You're going to go talk to a psychologist and and you think that he that psychologist is going to say, "Aha, uh -huh, you're crazy." No, that is never going to happen. Um, I was actually very lucky because that clinic had just taken on a new um, a, a psychologist just out of training. They said we can give you an appointment right away, but um, we want to be upfront with you this is someone who's just starting uh and doesn't have a whole lot of experience yet and i said okay well if i can come next week i can come next week that therapist then gave me two options and said we can go down the route of psychoanalysis and try and find out what the root of your problem is or we can go down the um uh cognitive behavioral therapy which disregards entirely what the reason for the problem is and builds for you the tools to manage your problem. And I said, I don't care what the reason of my problem is, I want this dealt with. So we went to cognitive, down the cognitive behavioral therapy route and I'm really, really grateful I did because, and I don't remember exactly how long, but three or four months of weekly sessions and I was done. Mm. I had then my anxieties under control. I still have a latent anxiety disorder that are still to this day things that make me very anxious but i have the tools to deal with that um and not always i'm not always able to deal with it there are to this day things that i avoid if i get anxious but um it's effectively under control but that fear of um of therapy of what that might mean is something that I mentioned earlier, I recognize and, and suddenly remember how difficult it was just to make that phone call. That was almost more difficult than accepting that I've got a problem. Yeah. Um, Isn't it like, now that to hear you talking about that makes me realize like, I feel like cognitive behavioral therapy is a little bit like life coaching. And the life coaching is not as medical or with a medical background, but people like life coaches don't have, have, have not studied medicine or psychology or anything like that. Um, but I feel the tools that are being transferred to the patient or the client are very much similar in equipping us to deal with fear, to deal with uncertainties, to, to get into action, to, to have structure in our daily practices. Um, so I've, I've, I've done both and I've found that life coaching sessions with self-declared or actually educated coaches have helped me equally well as compared to okay. therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. And therapy sessions are much harder to get where, whereas life coaching sessions you have to pay for from your own pocket. <laughs> so there's always you know the trade-off but i think i mean and that that's another interesting point that i think to put out there it always depends on how well you connect also with the therapist mm -hmm. so for somebody who's listening to this and says maybe hey i should do this and maybe i want to look for therapy now uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you match with your therapist very, yeah. very well so i do know people who have long-term mental health conditions and who have changed therapists several times until they finally found somebody that worked for them so i was really lucky um, that i found somebody that matched very quickly and we went down the path that worked for me very quickly and then it was solved in a couple of months um, i don't want to put that expectation out there that that is the case for everybody and certainly sure. and there are also rogue elements among therapists or coaches so if you feel uncomfortable with somebody you are perfectly within your rights to change therapists as well mm -hmm. yeah, it's so a very personal uh, project to engage in yeah. and it's it matters like tremendously to have what what you might call the right person in front of you but somebody you can trust and who understands and doesn't label you as a, you know just another patient but we really has a, a genuine interest in helping and seeing as a whole person and not like a clinical case and a statistic yeah well i think that that again depends on how well the two individuals are matched up you know um i think some 
a therapist must have a distance. Um, and, you know, when I finished my therapy, um, I was so grateful to my therapist. And I said, and that I finished my therapy in the time between I handed in my thesis and I was doing my defense. And doing my defense was something I was extremely worried about. I mean, anybody would be worried about that, but throw in a bit of anxiety disorder into the mix. And uh, that was um, a, a, a whirlwind of emotion. So through the therapy, I was able to face that. And I wanted, I was so thankful to my therapist. I wanted to invite her to my defense saying, I would not have been able to do this without your work. And she was very clear, said, no, this is a professional thing. And we are not taking that into the private sphere at all. You know, the, I am your therapist. This is a professional thing I do. I am not coming to your life event of graduating from the PhD, which I was a bit disappointed with at the time, but I completely see uh, yeah. the importance of maintaining that. Yeah, and that's a, that's a very thin and yeah, thin line and wobbly line to walk. The trust building and engagement with another person, but also keeping a professional distance um for everybody's safety and well-being also in the process i want to um because i've noticed in in recent times that, that that with people i speak to right through my work as a mental health first aider there are a lot of misconceptions about therapy a lot of fears about therapy that we've mentioned before perhaps describe a little bit about what it means to do cognitive behavioral therapy because mm -hmm. when i did it And uh, my therapist would ask me, can you please describe what happens to you when you have a panic attack? Mm. And so I would start describing the sort of situations that gave me a panic attack, as I did before, getting on a bus, sitting in a, in a lecture room, um, the prospect of doing a trip to China, uh, these kind of things. And she said, no, no, that's, that's the situation. I want to hear your internal process. What is the sequence of your thoughts that end up in this whirlwind of fear? Mm. And I found that very difficult to articulate in these sessions. So it became um, an exercise of waiting for such a panic attack to happen in order for me to able to record what my internal stirrings were mm. so I could describe them to my therapist later. And then a very interesting things happen. Uh, interesting thing happened that the kind of the one thought replaced the other. As I was trying to analyze my train of thought that would spiral into fear, it would break that train of thought spiraling into fear. Um, so that's probably the best way I can describe how cognitive behavioral therapy worked for me with an anxiety disorder, which is very different, perhaps, from the kind of perception that people have. That what this kind of therapy might be. Mm. So there is nothing to be afraid of there as somebody who's sitting in front of you is teasing your personality apart. That, that isn't at all what happens. So I want to dispel that myth and, and take away those reservations to people who might be listening. Yeah, and, I yeah. think there's also many tools and practices that therapists can dig into as they work with a patient. Because for me, it was, they would always ask me, I also had several, um, some of which I had really difficulties with. Because um, like there was one where I felt like, okay, you're not really listening. And like, I didn't feel understood. And, and it might just be that some ther or many therapists are clearly overworked. There are way too many patients. The, mm -hmm. um, there's no real matchmaking, way too few therapists, and at least in Germany, but as well I heard in other countries. Um, to way too many people who would um, benefit from therapy sessions. So, yeah, but then it was a mix of, they would always ask, how are you doing? And I, like when I was on, in the middle of an episode, it was always like, like empty. What, what should I say? Like same, same, <laughs> and, or I don't know. And then, yeah, also like giving, tools or sharing tools like structure your day what are your practices what are your achievements of the day celebrating small wins and if it's just oh i managed to brush my, brush my teeth before midday today <laughs> thing. and that can be a huge achievement and I, i know <laughs> um yeah and then 
so in, in that sense, I think many or some of the therapy sessions I went through were similar to what I've then learned also life coaches do, like in structuring the day, celebrating wins, um, not obsessing about failures, but drawing learnings from the failures and then again, focusing on the wins. And um, I would just out of my own experience and interest, I would like to ask, so anxiety and depression come with a lot of negativity. And then there's the other extreme of the whole scene of well-being, self-awareness. Um, what's the word? Um, like there's a trend. Mindfulness. And mindfulness and all of these um, life hacks, which focus on what some people would argue too much positivity because we kind of need both. But I've heard people say, but also again, like what's what's wrong with being positive about life? What's wrong with sharing positive ideas and thoughts and trying to turn around the negative thoughts into learnings mm -hmm. that you can then have a, a brighter light? Um, to well, let me, let me turn that question around a little bit, but I have become a very optimistic person, which I never was before I had mm -hmm. uh, my mental health therapy or I, I'm now very solution focused um, and I don't see when a, when a problem emerges, I don't, I don't worry about it. And I trust you, me, I have spent the majority of my life, uh, you know, to my mid thirties or so, which is when I uh, did the um, uh, therapy for my anxiety disorder. I would worry about just about anything. Mm -hmm. And now I look at, problems that present themselves as opportunities to find solutions and i have become really confident that i will find solutions uh, whatever life throws at me so i um yeah the worrying aspect has gone and it's it has really changed my identity in some sort uh, in some way that I've, I've gone from somebody who expects the worst and I, I i guess i do still expect the worst and plan for it but when it happens, I, I'm able to look at it quite soberly and say, right, okay, how are we going to fix this now? Not to get draw, like, drawn into it and um, freeze on it. Kind of thing. Yeah. 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 And also, like, and so, it's not that any of these super positive people deny the negativities of um, that we see in the world, but what does it help to, to worry, oh, the, the world might end tomorrow? Worrying helps you nothing and, and changes nothing. And that's what I've learned from my anxieties because <laughs> I spent my life worrying mm -hmm. and it it does nothing. Uh, it does nothing for you. It does nothing for others. It doesn't make the problem go away. It doesn't make the problem worse or better. Um, it's just you sitting there worrying. Um, so it's, it's easy to say stop worrying and it's not so easy to achieve that. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy can definitely work with that and and, and really because I know that we are coming towards the end of our time slot today we both have busy schedules today with other meetings which doesn't mean that we cannot continue some other time there's always more episodes to come right this, but I do want to get an, another really yeah. important point in of course. Uh, uh, and which is not from my own experience but I've been um, I'm involved in, with several mental health projects and schemes and uh, initiatives and whatnot and I'm talking with lots of people and I've recently spoken with two people a friend of mine who had a very severe depression and recently a lady who had anorexia and actually during my university as a very close friend of mine had anorexia what these three people have in common is that they were actually institute what we describe as institutionalized they went into a clinic and they stayed there um, and indefinitely until the the condition was fixed and and particularly my my, my buddy who who uh, had the severe depression he told me in very plain terms that was the worst case scenario that was the thing he feared most to be taken up into a psychiatric clinic and i think a lot of people fear that the padded cell that that um, i referred to earlier this perception that that's how we deal with the severely um, mentally ill. We lock them away, never to be seen again. And, and we view that as an end point. 
he said to me very clearly, and so did these two ladies who were in the clinic for anorexia, in the end, it was the best thing that could happen to them because it gave them the time, no timeline set, no deadline set to deal with their condition and you you go out when you're ready. Mm. And that turned his life around. So the thing he feared most, which was being in, taken into clinic, turned out to be the best thing to turn his life around. You're also taking so, away from all the triggers that might drag you down again. Uh, yes, people are reluctant to to large extent about psychotherapists, but certainly people are fearful of the prospect of being taken into clinic. And I also want to take that message out there that that is not the end. That can be the start of a new beginning. Mm. That can be the liberation of your life, not the entrapment that you think it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for adding that because, like. As you said, the worst case scenario is actually a best case scenario in many instances. And yes. people save their life and turn their life to a better again. What a great way to end it off. Because that's what it's all about, right? We we can accept the help that is out there to turn our lives around for the better. Absolutely. And that and that is a possibility. Um and it's it's guys, it's science based, it's evidence based. If this is no hocus pocus, you will not be branded. You will not be locked away, never to be heard of again. You can get the help that you deserve. So reach out for it. Um, I, that is the one message that I always, always, always want to get out there. It has I, completely turned my life around. Yeah. So, hey, as we said, yes, I've had a mental health condition. Get over it. I did. Yeah, and also I want to add like what I described earlier as the worst episode ever where I thought I would never get out of it. I eventually did. So the title of this episode also applies to myself. And then when I ran into another episode, I was like, well, this is not very comfortable. It's actually quite uncomfortable, but I know it will end at some point. I will, I know it's just an episode. And if it takes a week or two or three or a month or two but there's statistic like what's the longest possible period it might take and there's also medication where you can um where you can get out sooner um and but for that i would clearly also suggest to see medical um advice um before taking anything yeah, <laughs> um definitely. especially not self-described I subscribe but um there are solutions out there and we are not we are not few we are rather many of us and i think it's also normal for for people to be more cautious people to be more sensitive society needs a diversity of personalities and uh, it's a matter of us looking out for each other and one episode i would like to get um to talk to you about um in another chapter um, and at another opportunity is how is it for people in our vicinity? How is it for our parents? How is it for our partners? And what are the experiences that maybe you and I and what we've heard of others made with people in their surroundings? How can people who are not affect or affected at the time where we find ourselves in a condition deal with it and best support us? We had a little bit of this in the first um, conversation we had, you and I. But maybe we can go also into a few more details and examples of how we can look out for each other at a work placement um, within families, and especially for those who might think they don't have a social network they can fall back to. Um, yeah. There's still people in your surrounding you can reach out to seek help with. There are so many things to discuss still, and I'll be happy to do them in the future. I think my wife sometimes gets gets exasperated exactly how how positive and solution focused I am. Every time there's an issue, I'm like, yeah, we'll find a, we'll find a, a solution to it. Don't you worry. <laughs> and she's like, how can you always be so positive? <laughs> yeah, well, it's great. So I think I try like hard man sometimes. But doesn't kill us makes us stronger, and you it does. You it does become much you, stronger. If you think you have a problem and you're willing to accept the help, you might be surprised. The things I feared the most 
a full auditorium with lots of people. Now I relish standing in front of that auditorium, giving presentations. I, I love giving lectures. I love teaching at university. Uh, the irony is I almost never went to the lectures as a, as a student. And now, of course, we had the pandemic, lots, lots of it is online, but in my academic career, I found that lecturing, giving the, the, the presentations to students is the part I really love. It would have been inconceivable when I was still had my active anxiety disorder. So you, I've discovered new superpowers. That's what I always say. You might discover that your weakness is actually a, a strength wanting to blossom. And I think like some traditional cultures might say it's just a transitional phase. Like you're entering a new level in your purpose on being on this planet to help others, to spread the word, to fix the issues that we see as human societies. Um, so yeah, on to another episode. Um, okay, look forward to it already. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us today and we're looking forward to the next one. Thank you, Joe. Me too. Bye.